anything to do with this verse? I think so. How should a young person deal with an older person? And the thing that Paul is emphasizing to Timothy is you give them the respect that is due them. So uh, don't uh, sit in judgment upon them. Uh, this is not to say that an older person can't be wrong. Indeed, many times they are. But you need to be very respectful in the way in which you deal with them as a younger person. So I think that the whole concept of respect is behind the teaching that is given here. Does this verse teach that age should be respected? Yes. Yes. And he emphasized this in the relationship that a child has with a father. Children are to respect their father. Their father, that doesn't mean that the father is always right and the child is always wrong. Could be the other way around. But the, the bottom line is, you respect age, you respect those who have authority, uh, and this should be true with everyone. Uh, there ought to be a mutual respect that we have toward one another. What may be said about this verse in light of the verses that follow in this letter? Uh, almost everything that continues on in this letter that we're studying now is going to deal with Timothy's relationship with other people. How are you going to deal with other people? People of your own age, people that are older, people that are, are of your same sex, people of a different sex. Now, the content of this verse is primarily practical, not doctrinal. We've covered the doctrinal part. And all the way through Paul's writings, usually, if he's going to emphasize doctrine, that's going to come in the first part of the letter. The last part of the letter will be application, or the practical putting to use of the knowledge that he's imparted. Number five, is the older man in this verse an elder in the church? That's right. He may or may not be. So it could be, but it doesn't have to be. He's just simply talking about the age factor here, not the office or the position of an elder. What is a sharp rebuke? Calling out. Yeah, it's using words in place of fists. In other words, the kind of words you do, or the kind of uh, the way you use your fist, would be kind of like uh, the words that you're speaking. So don't let those words resemble a fist, even though you're not using your fist. So it's a, a figurative use of the term when he says a sharp rebuke, as if, uh, how could you be so stupid? How could you be so wrong? But the word stupid would be a case of being sharp, where might you consider a different position? It would be gentle. That would not be a sharp rebuke. Now, does the Bible place very much stress on respect for age? Yes, yes. yes it does. Write down Leviticus 19.32. Leviticus 19.32. This was especially true in the Old Testament times. In Leviticus 19.32, he says, You shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged, and you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. Number eight, do old men have the liberty to do as they please because they're old? No. Ha! Boy, you were ready with that answer. <laughs> do you know who you're talking to when you say that? I knew we'd get one right. Ah, yeah. I get the message, and you were very nice. All right. Number nine, what does it mean to appeal? Yeah, kind of like urging or begging or entreating. What will be true of this appeal if it is made to him as a father? Well received. That's exactly right, because it's going to be made in love, in respect. Number 11, what does this verse tell us about Paul's concept of the church? Family. Family. Folks, that cannot be underscored too importantly, in my opinion. So many times I think we think the church is a business. God doesn't treat the church as a business. Sometimes churches operate like a business. Now, I think we ought to use good common sense, just like we do in the family. We ought to use good common sense. And there are certain principles that apply both to the family and to a business. But there's one thing about a family that is vital, and that is the love aspect 
that each one has toward other members of the family. Does an equality of persons exclude the exercise of authority on the part of him who administers the admonition? No. No, I think no is the correct answer here. Uh, you know, we are equally uh, right and uh, important in the eyes of God, but there is a difference between individual persons within the family, and so it is in the church, and so it is with age. All right, would you read verse 2? The older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. Does Timothy have a responsibility to female members of the church? Yes. Yes, yes he does. Yes. What does it mean to treat older women as mothers? Respect. All right, respect them, love them, appreciate them, be genuine in your... <laughs> I'm glad I came tonight. <laughs> why, why was the instruction to treat younger women as sisters needed? Not to be excluded. Yeah, and this is a case of where Timothy is a young man and he needs to be careful of his relationship with the people, the younger women, about his same age. Uh, I don't know how it is in our colleges today. I only know that uh, when I was in college, the instruction that was given by the professors to me was made very strong. Uh, as a young man preaching, they said, don't you ever go inside of a house that is only occupied by women without somebody else with you. Just don't do it. When I got to graduate school, uh, T.K. Smith was a teacher of practical ministries. He emphasized the very same thing. Now, I know you all think I'm a bit odd, but I'm a product of my training. And uh, I remember T.K. Smith really grounded in. He said, men, don't even shake hands with a woman unless they extend her hand first and then be courteous to shake hands but don't go any further. What was he saying that for? He's trying to protect me. He's trying to keep down any unnecessary gossip. He's trying to keep away any possibility of people saying, oh wow, did you see that? And there are some things that are appropriate for some people that are not appropriate for other people. So, I think that this is behind what he's saying in this particular verse. Let, let me go on to number four. Um, what, what is the key word in verse two? Purity. Purity. Now that ought to say volumes to every one of us. And in our world, where so much emphasis is placed upon sex, and where so much uh, openness that is not right, I think we have to be very, very careful so is the word purity limited to sexual purity? No. No, no, but it obviously includes it. So we have to be very careful. Purity is a thing that ought to be uppermost in our minds. Not always easy, but it's always important. Number, verse 3, please. Honor widows who are widows indeed. What is suggested in this verse with the word widows? I wrote it on the board. You notice this, these are the two Greek words. Do you notice how... The definitions are very much alike. One word refers to the widow. Why is why are these two words alike? Because the widow has been robbed of her husband. And so there is a very close association. And it helps us to understand why are we concerned about helping widows. They need help. They've been robbed. And he's going to make a distinction now between the younger widows and the older widows that uh, are particularly be concerned about. Number two, did widows, particularly older widows, have an easy time of finding employment in New Testament days? Yes. No, they did not. Oh. Not in New Testament days. 
What is meant by honor as used in this verse? I think he's talking about help them out in any way you can. Show concern for them in a very meaningful way. Treat them uh, as you want to be treated if you are going to be in their position. Now what makes a widow a widow indeed? These are people, these are widows that have no living relatives. Now there's no one quite like a married woman who lost her husband in old age and has no living children, no living brothers or sisters, no living relatives. She is alone. So he's talking about a widow indeed. Now, where is the record, where is the first recorded instance in the New Testament of a problem with regard to the proper care of widows? Do you remember in our study of Acts? In Jerusalem, wasn't it? The Grecian widows were neglected in the daily distribution. I don't think it was done on purpose, but it happened. And when it was brought to their attention, they immediately did something about it. And you remember the instructions that were given? Select seven men. But what kind of men? Just any man? Just volunteers? No, no. Be careful about them. They should be people of faith. They should be people of character. These are people that have a good reputation in the community. People that would not be accused of having ulterior motives in taking advantage of an older person. So they're very careful in selecting these women, uh, these men rather, to care for these women that have been neglected. Verse 4, please. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents. But this is acceptable in the sight of God. Thank you. Now, is the church under obligation to help all widows? Yes. No, not at all. Particularly if they have family whose responsibility this is. And I think that that's something that's very, very important. And sometimes uh, children do not appreciate the uh, obligation they have to help older people in their family as the occasion may present itself. Is a child's care of parents a religious duty? Yes, it is. Uh, notice, this is acceptable in the sight of God. He's talking about family that cares for family members in their old age, in their time of need. Should the church's family, should the church's charity ever become a substitute for children doing what they can do to help their parents? No. no. We do a misservice when we rob them of the responsibility, and actually it ought to be considered a privilege. Now, why is it fair for children to provide for their needy parents? They provided for them when they were needy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's excellent reasoning, and I think that's exactly what the Lord has in mind. This is a case, folks, we have a mutual concern for one another, don't we? How interesting it is to see uh, what a wide range of ages are represented in the people who help take care of the little ones on Sunday morning. If you ever visited back there? Now, they are being cared for. Are all these people that are caring for them necessarily their biological family? No, no. Some of them may be or may not be, yes. I have a question. Sure. In these cases where the children are provided in the local and the church, uh, does the church have a responsibility to talk to those children about their parents? I think so. I think so. Uh, and I, I you know, I, I like the way you worded it to talk to them about it. I think that there are some cases of where children, well, I, it's not a matter of thinking. I know there are cases where some children just pay somebody else to take care of their old, the older members of the family. And some may need, be unaware, yeah. you know, there may be young or something that don't know. That's exactly right. And I, I, I think that's why going through verse by verse and a study of the scriptures is important because how many times do you hear this particular passage of scripture preached in the pulpit? Well, in your lifetime, how many times have you heard this? Maybe Never. Never? Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, I, I, I don't like to say this, but I, I confess to you there's some scriptures, as old as I am, I've never preached on yet. And uh, 
I don't understand these preachers say I can't find anything to preach on. Man. <laughs> I find more than I can handle. Why is the reason that you haven't preached on some of the verses already yourself? I'm sorry? You said there are some that you have not preached on yourself. Yeah. That's I true. said, and why is that? Haven't had time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to when I get, when I get a chance. Uh, some of them I don't understand well enough to preach on yet. Yes. You know, my uh, my dad, when we, uh, we took him over to assist the living, and he goes, um, he goes, well, now it's your turn to take care of me because you need to come and visit me and all that. And I said, what does that mean? Do I have to pay you an allowance? <laughs> like you used to do that when we were kids. Yes. <laughs> And so are you keeping the allowance going? Well, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, did I take him? No. <laughs> now, what does it mean to practice piety? I think this is simply a way of saying, uh, put your Christianity to practice. Show the kind of love for one another as God has shown towards you and as your parents showed toward you when you are little children. Now, folks, uh, think about this. Some little children grow up and they did, never did know the love of a father and mother. Mm -hmm. That makes the news today. And that's really sad. That comes back to what you said a while ago. Sometimes people don't know any better. They don't realize this is a God-given obligation, but it ought to be considered, I think, a privilege because it pleases God. And I think that the principle that is enunciated in the ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians not with a crutch or not with necessity, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I think that's true in the family too. It ought to be something that people enjoy doing. What example in the Old Testament do we have of one who is concerned about meeting the needs of an aging father? Joseph. Joseph, exactly right. Does this verse does does ver, this verse does not say that it is up to us to determine whether our parents are worthy of help? What does this verse say that settles the issue of children's responsibility to their parents? All right, this is acceptable in the sight of God. That's the thing that this says. Uh, so he's putting it in a very nice way, which is uh, underscoring what he has said earlier. That is, it's not the church's obligation, it's the children's obligation or relatives in the family to come through to help them out. Verse 5, please. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. All right, let me make a comment upon entreaties and prayers. We discussed this back in chapter 2 uh, where four different words were used for prayer. The word entreaty carries with the idea of personal needs. The word prayer is a general term. That might include praise, or thanksgiving, or petition, generally speaking, specifically, personal, otherwise, intercessory prayer. It, it is the general term. And treaties talks about for yourself. So she is a widow indeed who has been left alone, has fixed her open God, and continues to pray for herself, her own needs, for the help that she would desire, and must have, as well as praying for others night and day. In other words, night and day is expressing what is said in the first verse of chapter 18 of Luke. Uh, men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Uh, or what is said in the last chapter of First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. In other words, there ought to be a constant thought about God in our minds, awareness of His presence. Now, how does this verse define a widow indeed? Left alone. Left alone, that's right. So she has no one to, no family to care for her. Now would a younger widow be in the same position as an older widow when left alone? No. No? Uh, she more likely would remarry. Not necessarily, but Paul would encourage that. And she'd be more likely able to get uh, work and be able to provide for herself. Now, why does a widow indeed fix her hope on God? 
Independence. That's the only place she knows to turn. Where else is she going to go? Social Security hadn't been invented by that time. <laughs> what New Testament example do we have of a widow like the one described in this verse? Anna would be a classic example in the second chapter of Luke. Her husband passed away and she has ever since then been very, very active in the temple area, serving night and day, fasting and praying. Uh, Luke chapter 2 verses 36 and 37 is a reference that will describe her role as an older widow, one who's a widow indeed. Number five, what does this verse tell us concerning the religious characters, character rather, of widows indeed? She fixes her hope on God. That's right. She ha she's one who enjoys a good relationship with God. Uh, that speaks volumes. What is to be understood by night and day? Say that with one word. Always. That's right. We'd read verse 6. Always. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Okay, wanton pleasure is literally sinful luxury. Here's a person that uh, is the very opposite of a widow indeed. Here's a person that is engaged in uh, activity that's not becoming to a Christian. And uh, a person who's more concerned about uh, doing whatever she has to do in order to <coughs> please herself. Uh, now, we're not given any uh, specifics about uh, what this uh, luxurious living does to a person. I think it may take a number of different forms, but uh, he wants us to know uh, who this person is. Now, how do we account for such a person to be mentioned in this letter? Does this not suggest to you that there may be people in the church who are active Christians at one time and kind of fell away from the faith? And I think that we're talking about that kind of a person here. Uh, this may be like in the sermon in the parable rather that Jesus told of the farmer that planted seed. Some seeds fell on the thorny soil and the thorns just choked out all the good that could have been accomplished by that seed. And here I think is a, talking about a widow who has uh, been more concerned about the pleasures that this world has to offer than her relationship with God. So who are those who are dead while alive? Oh, those are dead in God's eyes. Alright, these are people who are dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 makes that very clear. Also down verse 12, it further underscores that. Uh, dead is simply a word for separate. And they're spiritually dead. They're separate from God. They're not the person they ought to be. Now, is the action of this verse a continuous action? And the Greek language gives the answer to that question. Yes, it is. Uh, this is a kind of a lifestyle that this person has adopted. And uh, this is what concerns Paul. Here's a person that's uh, a widow, but a younger widow. And now they've gone out in the ways of the world and neglected the Lord, neglected the church. Now, what is the responsibility to the woman described in this verse? I think, I think that there is. I think that if she is engaged in wanton luxury or wanton pleasure, I think that we need to regard that person as somebody who's not a Christian. And what is our obligation to people who are not Christians? Bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord. Try to reinstate them. So I think that the church has a responsibility to such a person to try to get them to be active in Christ, to live the Christian life. Does this woman deserve the same respect and honor that's due to a godly widow? Yes. Mm -hmm. Not the same respect and honor. A godly widow is going to be helped, but you're not going to help a person who is uh, unwilling to be right with the Lord. That would be kind of saying it doesn't make a difference whether you're a Christian or not. We're just going to help you live whatever lifestyle you want to live. I think that's not the business of the church. To encourage people to live a life that is contrary to what the Lord wants. But right. wouldn't you want to approach that person with love and respect in order to get
get them back. Absolutely. That should be true of every person. You're exactly right. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that uh, are begging today. And some of them have a genuine need. Some of them don't. They just made their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I think that helping that kind of person contributes to their problem, not helps them. And sometimes the real help they need is not monetary help, it's spiritual help. We need to make sure we make that kind of a distinction. All right, verse 7. Prescribe these things as well, so that they may, may be above reproach. Thank you. Now, included in they in this verse would be the widows that he mentioned in 5 and 6, or perhaps the children or the grandchildren or both. Uh, what's the reason for prescribing these things? We want them to be godly people. We want them to be above reproach. Talking about these people that have gone to the world and engaged in the world's pleasure rather than the Lord's will. We have, we have concern for them. We want them to live the righteous life as God so intended. In whose eyes is the church to be above reproach? That's right. Not only the church, but I, I, absolutely the community and certainly of God. Now, here's the clincher. Verse 8, would you read that? But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Pretty strong statement, isn't it? Yeah. What's the difference between this verse and verse 4? I think that what has been stated positively in verse 4 is now stated negatively and more inclusively. Uh, he narrows his focus in this verse down to any individual. So who are included in his own? Do you not sense that his own is a more inclusive term than family? Look at that verse. If anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, is there not a distinction he's making there? Seems to me like he is. Maybe this is referring to a slave. Some families, particularly back in the first century, slavery was so widespread, 60 million slaves in the first century. Uh, wouldn't it be unusual for a church to have an elder that was a slave, a Bible school teacher who was a slave? It's just a part of the Roman society. We'll have an occasion to say more about that later on. But uh, anyone else that uh, this person has an obligation to or is kind of taken under his own shelter and provided for. Uh, so he's saying you, you need to provide for those who are considered your own and especially for those of your household. Now, number three, is there any doubt about one's obligation to the immediate family? No. Not at all. In what way has one denied the faith as the phrase is used in this verse? He's not living the faith. He's rejected the love that we're supposed to have for one another. This is a sin of omission. Not that he's committing a sin. He's omitting something that's the right thing for him to do, and he's not doing it. Sometimes they say, well, I never did anything bad to that person. Oh, did you show love for them? Well, no. Well, you should have. Why? Well, you're a Christian. That's our obligation. So a sin of omission is just as serious as a sin of commission. This kind of person lacks love. Now, what's to be understood by faith as used in this verse? Is this a personal faith or the Christian faith? Christian faith. I think so, the Christian faith. Christian faith. What does it mean to be worse than an unbeliever? Hmm. Is there anything worse than that? I don't think so. That answers it pretty well with a question. Is there anything worse than that? I don't think so. An unbeliever is lost without hope. Really sad. Now, we're going to get a little more definition here of... Uh, who a widow indeed really is, would you read verse 9? A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. Thank you. Any Christian may be assisted, regardless of sex or age or marital status, so long as a person proves honest and in real need and unable to work. So wrote Carl Spain. I think he makes a good statement. Here, however... Who does Paul single out to be assisted? 
A widow on the list, over 60 years of age. So the requirement of the widow to be on the list, age-wise, is to be at least 60. Now, what is a, by the way, in that day, that would have been old. The, uh, anybody know what the average age is anymore of longevity of life? 77 years and nine months for a man. Yeah, like 82 for a woman. 82.3. 